Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining me. Um, so this is titled My First Year at Chef, Measuring All the Things. Um, some of you may know me from being around. Uh, I know. Um, I study sysadmins. I, I know. I'm getting trolled already. Welcome. Welcome. Um, I study sysadmins. I study how to make development and processes better. Because you can't improve what you can't measure, right? We don't really know how to make things better. So who am I, right? That's kind of my background. So I have a background in some sysadmining, some programming. Um, I was a hardware performance analyst. Then I went and got a PhD, which meant I really needed to make sure I understood how to measure things, how to define things, how to improve things, and then how to communicate those things. Um, I was in academia for a little while. And then Chef convinced me to leave and help them understand how to improve those things. So basically, I rub science on things to make your dev, your IT ops, and your dev ops better with metrics. So what do I do and how can you do this, right? The story is nice, but I think a talk is really helpful if, if we can get a few things out of this to really help us make our own work and our own lives a little bit better. So, AKA the talk outline. This is kind of some of the things that we're gonna try to go over today. Where do I start? What number should I think about? Um, what about benchmarking? What is that thing? Um, what else should I think about? So I'm gonna try to hit on some high level things. This is meant to be kind of a primer, so I am not Theo Schlossnagel. We will not be getting into some really, really nitty gritty advanced topics. We can, but this is meant to be kind of a high level primer. Some things you can think about as you go through. Um, some tips, some tricks, some things that we have done at Chef, some things that we're doing at Chef, um, including some basics and some, some places to start and then where you can grow and iterate from there. Um, and then some other things you should think about or you can think about as you grow and iterate along this journey. So where do I start? First, talk about it. So if you're starting off on your team, you're not really doing it, or if you're not sure about what you're doing, talk about it. Start at the highest level that's appropriate for you in your position in your group. Um, is measurement happening? How is it happening? Is metrics even a thing? What else is it called? Is there a lingua franca? Where is it happening? But all we do is fight. I mean, all we do is talk in circles. <laughs> um, you can point out that metrics actually provide an opportunity for communication. Um, so I've been doing a lot of work in the DevOps space, and it's been really interesting to notice that quite often developers and IT operations are doing very, very similar things and calling them completely different things. Or they're doing completely separate things and using the exact same word. So at least start talking about it, because it does provide an opportunity for communication, for alignment. You can keep calling it the same word and having it be totally different things, but once you've named it and defined it, because words have power and definitions matter, it gives you a place to start, okay? Uh, still not sure? Still not sure? Ask around. Ask people what is important to them. Start with your own team. So initially I said start at the highest level. Now come down to your level. What is important to my team? What's important to you? What's important to us? Who are our customers? What team do you support? What is important to us on our performance reviews? What's important to us? You know, ask your manager or ask your team lead or if you are the team lead. What do I want to report? What types of things do I get gold stars on my forehead for? What types of things do I get woken up in the middle of the night for? What types of things show up in meetings that are important? This can be done at any level of the organization. At Chef, this is what I did. I walked in. Now, because of the um, position that I was hired into, I was hired in as Director of Organizational Performance and Analytics. So I actually started with an email to the organization introducing myself, telling them I was very excited to be joining the team, 
and that one of the first things I wanted to start doing was introducing a culture of metrics. And I wanted to encourage everyone to start thinking about measuring things. And by the way, there was this really interesting free O'Reilly book that people might want to start reading through. You didn't have to, might be interesting. It's only about 20 pages. I got a lot of emails back saying, thanks, I didn't know about this. This was really kind of cool. And it was a really great way to have people start to think about things, start using a similar vocabulary, similar terminology, think about ways they could start measuring things, tracking things in more systematic ways. Another thing I did was establish the chef scorecard for 2015. What this was, was important milestones for every area of the business. Now, this was pretty ambitious, again, because of the position that I was hired into. This crossed the entire organization. I actually met with a member, every single member of the executive team, so every person that had a C in front of their title, CEO, CFO, CTO, CIO, um, every VP, every senior VP, um, every director, every person that had very, very broad impact strategy levels in the organization, and I said, what are your key deliverables and key milestones for the organization? Tell me the things that are really, really important, you, important for you. I was able to go through the last, I started um, early February, so I went through that, you know, through January's uh, key goals and key initiatives, and I was able to glean some of that already. But then I went to sales, I went to marketing, I asked them what was important. Now, the next key, it must fit on one page. So I took a little bit of liberty, and I started combining a few things that look like they might fit together. The key here is that it needs to fit on one page and no cheating on font size. So I'm pretty sure I set it at like one inch margins, and I think I went to 11 point font, not 12, but it was pretty consistent. I selected that because then if you wanted to, you could print it out and you could stick it up anywhere. This is easily digestible. Sure, it covers every area of the business, but everyone can see it, okay? Everyone can understand it. The goal here is that every single person in the organization, or you know, take this down to your own team level, everyone should hopefully at Chef be able to take a look at the scorecard and say, I am working on something that contributes to things that are important at Chef. And if I don't, then why not? Either it was inadvertently left off, or strategy changes, because strategy changes, right? Things change in our organization, things change in the broader technological ecosystem. Shocker, we work in tech, things change. That's fine, right? Measurements can change, things can change, that's totally fine. But if that happens, you should be able to talk to your manager and either change what you're working on or add or drop things on Chef's scorecard. So, by the way, this can include things that are difficult or not currently measured but this should give us an idea of things that we should be measuring or thinking about measuring. Do we want to take a look at the scorecard? So this is, a, this is an example, so this was the very first version of the scorecard, okay, so this is a little stale. This is the actual scorecard, by the way, it has been scrubbed, so I pulled our, out like our revenue targets, but this is the actual scorecard. This is not one page, because I obviously like blew it up and like made it big. So ecosystem training and community. This is actually what we had. So community health index, they were like, it would be really cool to have a community health index. I don't know how to measure that. Nicole, can you help us figure out how to measure it? Yeah, totally. So we sat down and thought about things that we might include in there. Because we have an open source product. So it includes things that aren't currently measured, or at the time weren't currently measured. Um, here's something that's even interesting. International infrastructure. That came from our VP of legal. She even made a comment later. This is really cool. No one's ever talked to me about this before. I love that I get to include something on this. She has one line. But this was great. So this is an example of metrics, improving culture, increasing communication and alignment. How effective is Learn Chef? So now everyone understands that, you know, as we're developing training materials, something like that should be included. We should be thinking about capturing that and measuring that. Financial, so like everyone's pretty much used to seeing financial goals, marketing goals, people, so like HR type of things, um, sales and business development. 
I'm pretty sure I cheated a little bit because sales and biz dev are actually two areas. And I was like, oh, sure, sales and biz dev, because by combining categories, I saved the line. <laughs> but now it's on one page. Product and engineering. Now, I, my, my focus for the year, I really started by focusing in on improving the engineering aspect of the organization. But by putting this on one page, this was another way of helping the organization understand that we were helping to become a metrics culture, right? So everyone starts working on some of this. And some of these things are obvious, right? Deliver against the 2015 engineering roadmap. But still, seeing it on one page, everyone can point to this. And again, metrics aren't set in stone. We can improve, we can iterate. For each metric, now for each one of these, we also, so we needed to define it, right? have a pretty good understanding of what that was, um, set a target, some kind of target condition, measure it periodically. So in, we were aiming for something around monthly. Again, hopefully we could measure it, right? There are some things that we're going to, like the community health index, that might be difficult to measure. So at, at some point we'd be able to measure it periodically. We might need to figure out how to measure these difficult things. We would also communicate it, okay? So the goal is to be able to communicate it. Uh, collect the measure it. Baseline it, so hopefully measure it early. So baseline is important. Current, so, so if we baseline it early and then measure it periodically so we would know where I am now. So now it's November. And then I would know where my target is so I can see where I am. Again, your metrics aren't set in stone. Start with an MVP, minimum viable product. Your metrics don't have to be perfect. We can start with something, okay? Iterate and improve. Toss what doesn't work. There were one or two of those things on there. I'll tell you now, we just tossed, which, which was also interesting, right? There were one or two of those items that someone insisted, this is super important, I have to have this, I am fighting for it. After two or three months of like, this isn't important, it's way too hard to measure, it was, this is important to measure, I wanna keep it on the list because it's important for us to think about. There were one or two of those things that I'm fighting for and it's gonna be on the list, two or three months of not being able to measure it, it was like, eh, okay, it's not a thing, toss it, right? But it's okay because when you revisit it after another month or two, it fosters those conversations. It facilitates communication, it increases alignment across the entire organization. Okay, that was where I started. It's where you can start. Now, what types of numbers should I think about? There are three broad categories of numbers that are a really great idea to always, always think about. The first is external, the second is internal, and the third is cultural. External metrics are those that are outward facing and customer focused. Whomever your customer is, okay? Your customer could be your own company. It's fine. Some type of outward facing customer focus metric. Your internal metrics are those that are inward facing and those that are focused something around process improvement. Okay? How do you make your own work better, faster? Cultural, because people matter. Happy cows make happy cheese. Happy IT ops, we know do our work better. Okay? We know this, we see it over and over and over again in the literature, sorry. I, I always point to research and literature, but we also know it because we see it and we feel it, right? Now, for extra credit. We can also keep in mind, so keep this in the back of your mind as we move forward, objective versus subjective. Okay, objective or hard numbers, things that we can actually collect. Um, so things we can pull out of systems, things we can pull out of HR systems when we think about cultural. Subjective, things that we ask people, surveys, so, by the way, we know that like bad surveys are bad, but good surveys are very good, okay? But they're still subjective. Even great surveys are still subjective, but that's the difference, okay? So objective versus subjective. We also have leading versus lagging measures. So lagging measures tell us what we already know. How long did it take me to deliver a feature is very important, but it's a lagging measure because I already delivered the feature. Leading measure suggests how long or suggests um, performance of something that's about to happen. Um, 
there are many more lagging measures than there are leading measures. And that's fine, that's normal. Okay, so where should I start? Start with your important things to my organization or team list, right? Because we probably want to improve things that are important to improve to someone and not just me, right? To our organization. This can include things like maintain excellent customer satisfaction. These are likely things that are going to be external. Um, increase speed of software delivery, hit revenue targets, increase software quality or usefulness. These can be lots of possible different things. Okay? So how does this apply to me? How does this apply to us? It gives us insight into metrics that are important in other areas. It helps us show and communicate our value to our organization. Because we know that we are amazing and what we do is important, but at some point, we likely have to communicate that value to someone else, probably. So this will allow us to do that. It identifies potential external metrics that we can tie our own work to, if we can help communicate those. And it focuses our effort on value-added metrics. Okay, so for one example at Chef, I went back and I looked at the engineering. I used an, um, an engineering initiative here. So where should I start? Identify a goal. Took a look at the Chef scorecard, 2015, I went to product and engineering, pointed out ship every day. So uh, we make configuration management product um, and shipping every day, the ability to ship um, our products every day was important, products or features. Um, sometimes that was happening, sometimes it wasn't. It wasn't necessarily always in a really consistent or totally, totally smooth manner across all of our features and all of our major products. So that was something that was going to be important. So this is what I picked for this example, okay? Is there existing data? This is our next question. Is there existing data? Is there anything we can take a look at? Who are the key people that I should be talking to? Because I'm new here, right? Like, they hired me. Or sometimes I do consulting, or sometimes I go into some of our clients who are the key people I should be talking to to gain insight into this. What things are important to support this goal? So, um, for ship every day, um, one thing that was really important from like a development process was test maturity. These are the things that, so when I was talking to the key people, they said these are the types of things for test maturity that we think are important. So when I took a look at the data, by the way, what data is in there, after investigation, there were no consistent sources of objective data available. So we had been using some Kanban boards, we had been using some other sources of data. When I started digging into that backend data, it wasn't great by like no fault of the engineering team, right? Several different engineering teams were using vastly different processes. It made comparison of the data across groups difficult, which is fine and totally normal. Um, one of the Kanban tools that we were using, um, I started digging into and I wanted to be able to track, see if I could track processes across that, right, as we move cards. Like that might help me understand how we're moving through. Um, even from that level, turns out the backend data for that tool is mostly useless. It looks like it's pretty good, it's totally not. So that kind of sucked, right? Um, so what we decided to do was back all the way out and start with subjective data collection, which is totally fine. And so what we're doing, or what, uh, sorry, so what we started to do was do initial interviews on a monthly basis with each team lead and say, for these pieces, we have unit tests, component tests, integration tests, upgrade tests, compatibility tests, and ancillary tests. Um, the team lead said, we think these are the really important things to do. So we meet with each team lead, and we say, you know, so here's an example for integration tests. These are the questions that, you know, the, the team started with, and they said, okay, every month we're gonna ask the team leads if they're doing these. And it started even with a simple enough yes or no, because some data is better than no data, right? You can't improve what you can't measure. So we said, okay, we're just gonna ask them yes or no. Because who, can we ask yes or no questions? Is this something we could do in this room? No, like I'm serious, not rhetorical. Like we could at least start here, right? So this was a great way to start out. This was a fantastic way to start out. 
Because we can do this. Is this something we can do? Yes or no? And so for each of these, we had a handful of tests. And the really great thing here is that it also provided a really great degree of self-reflection for each area to help them understand where they were. Sure, it's subjective. Takes a little bit of time, but not much. It gives them really good insight into what they're doing. Percentages are calculated for each. Now, one of these graphs, graphs, sorry, is, is calculated. Um, so for at this point, I have, uh, this, this is two months into the process, okay? And this is for one particular product or feature. So one of these graphs uh, is made for each product or feature, okay? So you can see the percentage of, it's so basically like a yes is zero, or sorry, a yes is one and a no is zero, right? It's super straightforward, like, right? So we started doing this in like Excel or Google spreadsheets or whatever. Um, so yes or no, you can see the calculations. Unit, component, integration, upgrade, compatibility, performance, security. So remember how I also mentioned that like you can iterate and improve? At some point, so like month three, month two or month three, Right, it's like, oh, performance and security would also be awesome. Which is why that's a whole bunch of zero, right? Because it was like, we should totally add this. Awesome. So we just didn't have data on it. Totally fine. So you can also, this is charts for all test maturity for each, so like this is why it's totally scrubbed, right? Um, so there were also, <laughs> this was all of the product or features. Notice there's also communication. This is visible to the whole company. They don't, like, they probably don't take a look all that often. This is visible to the entire engineering organization. It's not necessarily a bad thing. Even a bad baseline is good because you can see where you start. So this is uh, one month in time. Each of these pairs is, I, I've scrubbed it. I, I pulled it off on purpose. Each of these pairs, so this is two months in, each of these pairs is a different product or feature. So you can see some products or features that are more mature or farther along. Um, some of them that are a little bit low or probably newer. One thing that's interesting, you also notice that some of these metrics tend to go down. Um, what happened was the teams went back through and they decided they wanted to add more questions. They wanted to add more questions, so it made it look like it dropped. We could have normalized those, but they decided, you know what, no, it's fine. It's not worth the extra calculation. We all know what's happening. We're fine with that. We understand what's happening. But this is fully visible. It increases alignment. Everyone knows what's going on. So what about benchmarking? Does everyone here know what benchmarking is, basically? We'll talk about it here, OK? A benchmark is essential. A benchmark is basically a comparison, OK? You, what you must have in a benchmark is truth. Even a bad baseline is good. Even a bad benchmark comparison is good. You want to know what you're being compared against because it, it allows you to understand how you compare. Because a comparison is important. You want to have at least one reference group. You might be comparing yourself, I said within team, but it may be like within, so your own software team, like so it may be within yourself, right, your own team. In which case you'll notice that I showed you, I started by showing you two months of data because you're comparing yourself now and before. You might be comparing yourself to another team. So the next one I showed you was all of the products lined up, so you could see all of those products compared. You might be able to do the whole company. You might, there may be benchmarks available for the entire industry. Those aren't always available, but if they are, that can be useful as well. They should also be communicated and visible. Again, for the communication and the alignment. People should be able to see at all times. So Chef is a distributed company. Um, we're using Google Spreadsheets for this. But a lot of places like Etsy use, just have banks of monitors all over. But they should be visible because you want to see where you are and how you're doing, in part because it facilitates conversations. People start talking about this. So, what's important? Truth, you're, you're gonna have to like trust me on this. <laughs> but these, so they're subjective, right? So they hold some opinion, 
but the team, all of the teams have decided it's really important for us to know where we are. So at least people are sharing what they feel is true, okay? They are communicated and visible. They are, they are called out in every month's engineering all hands with a link provided. So a screenshot is shown during the all hands in the, in the presentation and a link is shared so everyone can see them quite openly. A link is also shared not just to the charts but to the underlying questions and feedback is invited, which is why they started going down because a few people on the team said, do you know what, I really want to add a couple more questions. I think this would be a great idea. Um, there is at least one reference group. In this case, the reference group is both to this month and last month. So we have a, group, a reference within ourselves. We also have a reference across. If we wanted to, we could actually, so there's a, there's a visual reference across product groups. If we wanted to, once there's a little bit more data, we could calculate um, a company baseline and maybe put like a dotted line across in a different color. Um, at this point, I, I, there really isn't enough data there for that to be meaningful. Um, even a bad baseline is good, although I wouldn't necessarily call this bad because that is an immature product at this point. They're just starting. But you can see that like everything is out there. So that's an example from Chef's Engineering Initiative. Again, your metrics aren't set in stone. They're continually improving. Start with an MVP, then iterate and improve. Again, these are a bunch of yes, no questions. But they can immediately see areas for improvement. Um, toss what doesn't work. So, at Chef, we identified a goal, ship every day. That was an external goal, so we also were keeping track of how often we are able to ship every day. We have percentages on that. Um, test maturity is an internal. I haven't talked about cultural yet. Within cultural, um, I've done a bit of work on state of DevOps work, and it's shown that both in dev and ops contexts, there's a particular measure called the Westrom cultural measure that's particularly good at predicting IT performance in technical contexts. So take a quick look at this outline, the summary of power-oriented work cultures, rule-oriented work cultures, and performance-oriented cultures, also called trust-oriented cultures. Who in here currently works in a power-oriented culture? Or has a friend that works in a power-oriented culture? <laughs> who in here works in a rule-oriented culture? Okay, and who in here works in a performance or trust-oriented culture? Okay. The data shows that this is how it tends to break out. We tend to see about 50% in rule-oriented, about 33% in generative, and about 15% in power-oriented. Notice I use like nice words like power oriented, not pathological. <laughs> Trying to be nice. Um, the highest IT performing companies do tend to be, not tend to be, statistically are generative. Um, we do see significant differences here. So um, there have been a few technical teams at Chef that have decided to roll out the Westrom Cultural Survey. So this is going to be a subjective measure. Um, but this measure has been shown to be very highly statistically reliable and valid across over 14,000 respondents over a few year period. So it's included in Chef's yearly employee survey. As I mentioned, there's also an IT team that, that rolls this out at least quarterly. This is interesting because it is both a lagging measure, it tells you how things have been. This is also a leading measure. If your culture scores take a, take a dive, for an unexplained reason or even explained, if it takes a dive and you don't pay attention to your culture, your automation and tooling will, will start falling apart in three to six months. Here's how this works. Rate how strongly you agree, seven, to disagree, one, on the following statements. You rate these, you, you answer that for one to six, and then you come up with an average. And it gives you basically your culture temperature. So we have also covered culture now. Quick summary, three types of metrics, external, internal, and cultural. Benchmark your metrics. And you can also consider subjective versus objective, which we've done. Consider leading versus lagging. Now, most metrics are lagging, which is normal. 
Westrom is both leading and lagging. Now moving forward, we are also going to consider adding whip limits because whip limits are a really, really good leading indicator. As your whip limits start growing and growing and growing, um, your, your work performance is going to start going down because the cognitive load is way too high, you do way too much context switching, things like that. So, we have one more example at Chef I'm going to like super sprint through because I'm like over time. Um, so we like, can I like race through this because we know to like identify a goal. The goal is increased commercial adoption of premium features. The existing data was basically a count. Like our customers were like, how many premium features are they using? That's okay, but it's not great. Also, the data wasn't always good. It was unreliable. So it became DevOps journey assessment. The key areas, they identified several key areas. Each of those key areas is based on, um, is built off of a conversation with customers. So we're helping them assess their own journey with several questions. So it provides a more holistic view. This is an example. And they can see, now this is interesting. We provide them a benchmark now across two different areas. One is um, as of one date. So the blue is where they were currently and the red is their goal state. So instead of now and past, it was now and goal. This is a, a fairly advanced customer. This is another customer, which is, so even a bad baseline is good, right? So I've pointed out a few things. At least one reference group, themselves now, themselves in the future. Um, truth, and it was communicated and visible to the customers. So they went through the assessment, we provide them with this as they move forward. And it provides a really good baseline for communication for themselves within their team and for us with their own account managers. There are a few areas that we see overlap, right? There are some areas, they, it might just not be a goal for them in the next year, that's fine. Totally fine. Again, internal, external, cultural, they covered all three of those areas. Benchmark metrics, so the next step is to create an overall customer benchmark. So I'm working with the team now to provide benchmarks across all of the customers that we have collected data for. Um, and then again, considerations of subjective and objective and leading and lagging. Most of the data right now will remain subjective, that's fine. Okay, what else should we think about? So advanced topics for stats nerds. Um, measurement distributions, you should consider distributions of probable outcomes. You probably won't hit an actual target, so what's a reasonable range that you're okay with? Um, you should discuss variance of metrics. So when you collect your metrics, how, how crazy is that range, right? Are you, are you relatively predictable when you hit those metrics, or are you like all over the map? That'll talk about how consistent you are. Don't ignore the rate of change in your data. Okay, when you move from one month to the next, how crazy is that rate of change? That will yield some valuable insights. Be careful about normalizations in the reporting of your metrics. Normalizations are good when you want to compare across groups. However, normalizations smooth the data. A defect is a defect. Downtime is downtime. Bad is still bad. Pain is still pain, okay? But normalizations are good for comparing across groups. Um, one mentioned distributions of data in operations and development are rarely, <laughs> never normal. Don't be reporting like standard deviations. They aren't meaningful. Report medians. And then one last note from the team that brought you um, State of DevOps report. Um, we are developing a tool for some benchmarking to compare your own IT performance across industry standard because industry standard data is pretty rare. So if that's something that's of interest to you, if you would like an exclusive invite to the benchmarking tool, chance for personalized analysis, a copy of this presentation, a copy of a metrics guidance white paper. So there's a, I think it's about 20 pages that covers a lot of this material in more depth with some other examples that are not from Chef. You can send an email to Nicola Fee at sendyourslides.com. Subject is DevOps. So again, um, if you want an invite to the tool, um, some personalized analysis. I will include a copy of this presentation um, and a copy of that metrics guidance white paper. I'll just send you a link to it. You can shoot me an email to NicoleFV at sendyourslides.com and um, have that subject be DevOps. It'll shoot you an email and then you can opt in.
thank you very much for your time. Do we have any questions? Yes. And there is a mic. Great. I'll use it. <laughs> then we can have it. So um, when you were get, developing the initial scorecard, mm -hmm. um, how long and how much negotiation did it take you to get the key leaders to boil everything down that small? So I didn't invite them to boil it down that small. I just invited, like I, I met with everyone and asked for their time. Uh -huh. And I got the key things that were important for them. And then I went ahead and boiled it down and then asked them for their feedback to make sure that the boiling down was okay. If there were key places where I boiled it down and I wanted to make sure that that was an appropriate combination, I called that out to them. Okay. But for the most part, they were like, oh yeah, totally. Great. There were one or two cases where someone saw what someone else had, had offered me. They asked to see what someone else had said and they said, oh yeah, totally. Actually, I was gonna say this and this is more inclusive than what this other person said, so I think they'd be fine with it, but make sure you run it past them. Cool, thanks. Sure. And, and actually, how long was that process? Um, just because of scheduling, it ended up taking me about a month, month and a half, but I was also dealing with like all executives and it was right around ChefConf. So I was in part, ChefConf was great because I had everyone like mostly together, but then after that it was chaos. Cool, thanks. Sure. So he asked if they were using OKRs or MBOs or anything like that. <laughs> So, objectives and key results, management objectives, um, they were. So, so I, I just, well, and they were using key performance indicators in a few cases. I mostly just tried to make sure I collected the things that were important to them and then communicate them back. I tried to have it just be a mirror back and make sure that it reflected the things that were important. There were one or two things that I didn't necessarily think would remain important, but that was, I was pretty sure that was going to come out eventually as we iterated and improved on the metrics. Yes. I'm sorry, so there's McNamara fallacy and that's what? Yeah, can you use the mic? Thank you. So yeah, Robert McNamara had this uh, metric which was body count, and that was success. Effectively, it's measuring the wrong metric leading to the wrong outcome. And I was wondering oh, how Oh, so you... gaming metrics. Well, I don't know if it was gaming, it was just stupid. And so, <laughs> I don't think that he was trying to game the system, but the point is, is that over-optimizing for the wrong metric. What's your experience with that, and, and how do you kind of course correct? So there, there are a few comments to that. First of all, you will, you will get what you measure, right? Um, one of the best ways to avoid gaming of metrics is to collect several of them. If you only collect one metric, it's quite easy to game that. If you collect several metrics, it can be pretty difficult to only game, or to game several metrics at once. Um, if you tie, if you collect several metrics but only reward one of them, guess which one will be gamed, right? Um, there are a few other things to think about. One is, um, Performance reviews tied to metrics is a bad idea. Um, we know that teams perform, individuals don't. So those are, those are some other things to think about as you move forward. Um, but it, it also depends, so early on I talked about have your metric and define it. If your metric for success is body count, legitimately, then the more body count you have, then you have actually succeeded in, in capturing that and in defining that. So that's why words have power and definitions matter. And so you may need to iterate through and capture what you, you know, redefine your metric or add another metric. And if you pay, place way too much emphasis on one metric or if you only have one metric and not three or four, then they will be gamed. Did that answer it? Yeah. It's, it's tension. Well, and it's also um, understanding that metrics should be used for improvement and not only as a hammer or a carrot. Every, we're all on the same team, hopefully. Is that time? All right, I'll ask a question. Okay. I'm gonna bookmark the day, or benchmark, or yeah, bookend the day, sorry. Um, this morning in the keynote, you saw the keynote? 
No. Okay, too bad. Uh, so, but one of the things that the one of the things that, one of the things that Kasky, or that that Mikey talked about was um, how the the government has um, just the wrong incentives in a lot of places. Yes. And I was hoping that if you had seen the keynote or if you had any idea about that, that you know anything you would you would promote there because that's one of the things he's looking for from this kind of audience. You know, is is incentives? Com- well, Promoting yeah, the right they're incentives? basically completely inefficient metrics, and and unfortunately, and then inefficient um, uh, incentives resulting from those. So I think it comes down to figuring out what it is you want at the end, and and capturing that, and then building some metrics around to support that. Right. The challenge really is that if you if you have metrics only as a carrot or only as a stick, and you're only using them as a way to incentivize things, that's going to be a challenge, and and. That's a lot of times the way things work. The other challenge, a lot of times the challenge in the government is you have such long approval cycles that once something is set in stone, the funding cycle mandates that that, well, luckily um, Mark Schwartz and a few of his colleagues are, are changing some of that. But a lot of the time, the way the funding cycle worked is you, you fought for a whole bunch of funding and then it was locked in for a set amount of time and there, was, there is no agile, there is no pivot, there is no way to change what you're doing because that's what the money's for. Like you write, I was in academia, you write a grant and that's what you're gonna do and like suck it because like you're stuck. That's what you have to do. It doesn't matter if priorities changed or if the whole market changed and that was what you needed to do because you wrote a 400 page proposal and it said that was what we were gonna do in this method. And that was the only way to get money. Before we, we clap for Nicole, I do want to say that we have a rare double header. Nicole is going to be here tomorrow at 11 yes. doing another talk. So uh, let's have a round of applause. Thank you.